Good morning, Mark. How are you doing today? Good, good, good morning. I'm doing well, thank you. Very, very well. Do, do you know how many people have been waiting for this book? We just can't get enough of Queen and Freddie Mercury. I mean, I, 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 I was there when they first appeared on the music scene as, as a fan and a collector of albums and 45s, and, this, and I still crave them. You still wanted more. You I never do. Have enough. I do. I do. And and I, and I can't explain why th this book affects me the way that it does, other than I guess I'm a super fan. I don't want to be a groupie, but I'll be a super fan. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds like a good thing to aim for. What What is so inspiring about your book, Magnifico, The A to Z of Queen, was that you were there and you took great notes. And now you're saying, here, they belong to you, the reader. That's one way of looking at it, yeah. But when I was going to see Queen in concert and buying those records, I probably never imagined that I'd ever write a book about them. But yeah, maybe I was sort of secretly storing it all up for future use. Yeah, I I, I got to see Queen on their most recent tour, and I it, the the performance was. I, first of all, I I, I loved it uh, when when they stepped out there and said, "This is not Freddie Mercury's Queen. This is Queen with a special guest." And I thought, I love you for it. I love you guys for being that honest with your fans, but still to embrace those songs. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a good way of doing it. They they've always made it clear that they're not trying to replace Freddie Mercury, but that, it, that this guy is coming in and they're playing. He's paying tribute to to Mercury, but he's his own guy. You know, I think Adam Lambert's his own guy, and I think that really helps. That makes a huge difference. What did it do to your creative psyche in the way of when you when you, when you put your words into paragraphs, which become chapters, becomes a book? Yeah, all of a sudden, you know, everything that you have lived is right there in front of you in words. Uh, well, it jogs it jogged my memory doing this book a lot because it made me cast my mind back to being ten years old, nine mm -hmm. or ten years old, and seeing Bohemian Rhapsody, the video for Bohemian Rhapsody on TV as a kid, and then it cast it made me remember buying those singles and particularly going to see them in concert. I think that was a a big thing. I saw some of the shows at Wembley Stadium that they did, and the last concert at Nebworth here the last concert in the uk so what happened with this book is it really jogged my memory that that was the thing i gotta tell you that I, I i truly believe that i'm in radio because of two songs philadelphia freedom from elton john and and bohemian rhapsody because i would i would scan that am dial to find long distance radio stations and i landed on koma out of oklahoma city they they played both of those songs whereas my local station in billings did not yeah i mean in the uk bohemian rhapsody was on was on the radio all the time it was inescapable because it was a it was a christmas number one in 1975 wow. so every time you turned on the radio you heard that song you, you there was no escaping it <laughs> so so why don't we get tired of this song well i think there's lots to get involved in i i didn't listen to it for years because i thought i'd heard it enough times and then i listened to it again when i knew i was when i was trying to write the book and i again i was still found new things to discover i think it's almost like it's too much to take on in, in one go mm -hmm. it's just the ambition of it it's exciting it's it's completely over the top and flamboyant but of course it's got a great melody you can still hum the song it's complicated <laughs> you can if you don't like humming one bit you can hum the other you know it's it's a song for all seasons, isn't it? <laughs> Dude, I, I, I got I to gotta be honest with you, Mark. The, somehow, some way, I got all the tracks, and, 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 and they're all saved on my, on my hard drive. But I can sit there and listen to every single track individually. And to go in there and listen to Freddie and, to, and then to hear every, you know, like the bass tracks and stuff like that, I, I, I am, it made me even a bigger fan of this band. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It, nothing was ever done by just one individual. They they never worked as well apart as they did when they were together. And although that's Freddie Mercury's song, he brought the idea to the table. I think the other the contributions of the others can't be underestimated. I mean, you talked about the individual tracks. I mean, Roger Taylor's high harmonies, oh all those Gal all those Galileos. I mean, that that's him. He's getting he's getting up there. He's up in the ozone layer. He's so high up his voice on, on that one. In in the book, uh, Magnifico, the A to Z to Queen, you, you say that it's Freddie's story. I, I get that, but I've been with Brian May, and he's got a story too. Yeah, there's all of their stories. Yes. You know, you know every, every single person in that band brought their own story to the music. 
you know, all of them just in different ways. And I think because they were four very different individuals and different personalities, you've got four different stories going on in Queen. And you can hear that in the music. Did Freddie know that he had a great voice or was it just something that he carried with him uh, through each and every day and, and he knew that it enlightened other people's hearts? I don't think he knew he had a good voice at yeah. the beginning because the others didn't think he had a good voice at the beginning. And if you ever heard recordings of him very, very early on singing before he was with Queen, his voice isn't so great. But what he did, and this is something Roger Taylor talked about a lot, he made himself a good singer. Mm -hmm. He took what he had and he just worked and worked and worked at it. And in a relatively short space of time, he sort of came out that that Freddie Mercury voice was fully formed. But I don't think it was there at the beginning. It wasn't at all. He was a, he was a piano player as a kid. In his first group, he played piano. It's only later that he got the confidence to start singing. Does it does it bother you that when people think of Freddie Mercury, they, they inside their mind they see Remy Malik in, in a way? Because, I mean, I, I really want to see Freddie's face when I hear a song. I, I don't want to see Remy. Yeah, I don't see Remy. Well, like, you know, we're old school, so we yeah, we yeah. see Freddie Mercury's face. I don't see Remy Malik's face. I think it's interesting. I think you're right. I think a lot of people came rediscovered Queen's music or even discovered it for the first time through that film, and as a result of that, yeah, maybe to them it is going to be Remy Malik. Yeah. I got to tell you, Mark, the, I, I'm a mobile entertainer, so I do a lot of weddings and parties and stuff. Every age group right now is requesting somebody to love. And I'm going, this isn't even your generation. What are you doing with my song? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's one of the songs. It's like Don't Stop Me Now, which yes. is the same. Yep. Yeah, I mean, Somebody to Love was a big hit here in the UK. But it wasn't, um, you know, when the last couple of times I saw Queen, they didn't play Somebody to Love. They certainly didn't play Don't Stop Me Now because Don't Stop Me Now was a, was a flop in the UK, wow. these are songs that have had a second life as a result of, you know, even before the film, I just think people rediscovered them. Um, but it's extraordinary. Yeah, you're, you're, you're obviously getting quite possessive about the, uh, the old Queen <laughs> Possef Possessive in the way that when I saw them in concert, they didn't do You're My Best Friend. And that is my ultimate Queen song. And it's like, and I, I just literally stood there when, when the concert was over going, get your butts back here and play my song. Yeah, that, you know why? Because the others didn't really like it. Really? It's John Deacon's song. He wrote it for his wife. And, and, and despite what they say now, the others were a little bit sniffy about that yeah. song. <laughs> they, they, you know, it's, they thought it was a bit lightweight and a bit pop for them because it was still the 70s, wasn't it? They were still a rock band yeah. then, weren't they? Yeah. So, so did the movie get it right then when it came to them sitting around a table and they were discussing songs? I mean, even the song about the car and stuff like that. It's like I, I never saw, you know, I, I never heard that story when I was reading those rock magazines. Yeah, the, the car story is true. They, they, the, the others, yeah, definitely, because of course they, the car song, I'm in love with my car, got on the beat side of bohemian rhapsody and when bohemian rhapsody was a huge hit that meant roger taylor made more money yeah. <laughs> than, than brian man john deacon and so next thing he's pulling up up at the studio in a new ferrari um he's bought a new house all off the back of i'm in love with my car so there's always been a little bit of lingering uh, resentment about that song i think what they became masters of that I, I swear that nobody else has really tried it we will rock you into we are the champions if a bicycle race into fat bottom girls i mean every time i hear those songs on a classic rock station today i want to hear the second song immediately afterwards yes they did they, they the two sides of the single kind of spoke to each other didn't they yeah i mean you're right i mean but yeah absolutely I, I mean i think bicycle race one of the the greatest queen songs of that era of the 70s because it just doesn't sound like anything else or anybody else i mean who else would write a song like that about a bicycle <laughs> well it had it well it had to be that band because I, to me i felt like that they were always in touch with who their fans really were yeah sure yeah that's it it, it works perfectly but you're right you want it to go you want to hear fat bottom girls don't you straight after what did you learn from writing this book? I mean, I realize you took the notes and you 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 went you were face to face with everything taking place, but still you're you're a student of this band. Yeah, I guess so. I think what I took away from it is the fact that what what a lucky accident it was yep. for these four individuals to find each other. And you could say that with the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, but I think with Queen, you these are four people that probably wouldn't have even been in a room together. Under, under ordinary circumstances, but you had four intelligent people who could all write songs. The fact that they could all write songs is a game changer here because it's nobody's coasting. You know, everybody has to be on top of their game the whole the whole way. And that's what I, that's what I took away from it is the fact that 
all four of them contributed to this. You take one out of the loop, it, it, it's not Queen anymore. I'm so glad you put it that way. And the reason why is because I have based my entire radio career on that the Beatles were four individuals who happened to make harmony. So therefore, at a radio station, there happens to be five different jocks on the air. We've got to create harmony. And and bands like Queen, you know, they they they, they just happened to come together in a moment of history. Yeah, they did. And and and, it, and they made it work. But of course, to make it work is they f had to fight very hard with each other as yeah. well. And I think that's something you've got to understand, that, you know, when you research this story. Yeah, they fought over these songs. They fought over guitar solos. They fought over a few notes just to get it right or how they wanted it to be. But I, I totally get that because even when I was in my bands and stuff like that, those fights mean a lot. That's where that there, there's so much that comes from those arguments. I mean, I still remember crushing my my lead guitarist fingers in the car door because he just wouldn't stop doing what he was doing. And 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 yeah, so it's, it's crazy stuff that we do as musicians. That's it. It's a familiar story. I mean, I think Roger Taylor sprayed Brian May in the face with hairspray once when they're having a row backstage in, in, in a dressing room. He lost his temper and he, he, he turned the aerosol on. Him. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> So Radio Gaga, that song still resonates because to me, it's because I was that seven to midnight jock on the radio and and and, mm -hmm. and it, it spoke to me because it was Radio Gaga, radio. I mean, it was because we do speak a bunch of Gaga on the radio. And I felt like that Queen was saying, this song is for you. Now share it with your people. Yeah, I think there was. I mean, this, the other thing at that time is video was becoming yeah. very dominant. Wasn't it? 1980, when we were talking 82, 83, MTV had launched that was obviously huge in the states less so in the uk we didn't we, you know we didn't have it quite so much then but the video became all powerful and i think at the time it was their sort of way of saying that the song is the most important part of it but yeah any song that mentions radio is bound to get played on the radio <laughs> I think there's some canny mar there's some canny marketing there because that again that was another single that was a huge hit here in the UK and you you switched on the radio you couldn't escape from it because presenters all wanted to play it because it was about it was about the radio it's about the format wasn't it well yeah and 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 look at Lady Gaga who who says she got her name from that song yeah exactly I mean I didn't even you know I didn't even make that connection when when Lady Gaga came along it wasn't till. Uh, later on, she realized she was such a huge Queen fan. Oh, but, and, and look at her performance. Do you not see Freddie Mercury just bleeding from her? You, you do now. Yeah, I did. But I probably didn't make the connection right, right. in the beginning. Right. Yeah. How, how did you like the way that the movie presented the big concert at, at you know, at, at We Are the World? Because, I mean, I've gone back and watched those videos where they compare both of them at the same time. And I'm going, my God, they really played this out. Yeah, they played it out. I mean, the performance was incredible. The, the actual Queen performance on stage, the way that they mimicked the original was great. I mean, I, I've been to the old Wembley Stadium wow. in the 80s, and it wasn't as clean as that Wembley Stadium <laughs> they've got in the movie. It's a little bit more 21st century. <laughs> I wouldn't say the audience was as good looking as it is in the film. <laughs> Um, it was, uh, so, you know, the original Wembley stadium was a bit of a dump, as we say here in the UK. So it's a slightly cleaned up version of it, but yeah, the actual performance was incredible. They scrutinized everything, didn't wow. they? They got it absolutely spot on. They did. So how true are the rumors that there was music created between Freddie Mercury, Elton John and Rod Stewart? I, I haven't had my hands put on that yet. And I really would like to hear it if they did. I don't think there was any music okay. actually which I think they, there may have been a jam, there's a jam in the studio with Rod Stewart. Maybe Jeff Beck was there. Uh, um, that was in the 80s when they were making the works. They were in uh, the big studio in Los Angeles. Its name escapes me now. But I don't think there was anything recorded. There was other stuff they recorded with David Bowie. Mm. Um, I, I know that exists, yeah. Mm. And, well, what about when he was working with the Sex Pistols? And the, one, and, and the reason why I bring that up is because I've been with the guys, and, and the thing is is that they always used to tell me, it's not punk rock, Arrow. It's the blues. Get it right. It's the blues. So I thought, wow, Freddie Mercury with a blues band? Yeah, well, well what was this with the Sex Pistols? What was this when they, when they were both recording in the same studio? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it, that just blows me. I mean, first of all, I mean, I realize that you know they're all from the same region, but but why wasn't something released with it, with with the, with this collaboration? Well, they never collaborated. No, not that I'm aware of. It's just that Queen were recording in one room. They were recording "We Will Rock You" and "We Are Champions" that era, 
and um the sex pistols were were doing overdubs on uh their album at the time but i never knew that they i've never heard the story that they actually collaborated though and i've never heard that so maybe you 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 you've got a good you've got a new story there i should have had in the book well you, you, that was but but you know how these little these tabloids are you know they they they, oh, yeah. they they put a headline out there and you you automatically believe it yeah no harm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and Queen was definitely one of those bands because Freddie Freddie put himself out there as a front man. I mean, he made sure that he was getting whatever he could to help promote everything they were doing. Yes, he did. I mean, I think this is something that you cannot underestimate his performance as a as a as a performer. Um he was like the ringmaster, wasn't he? He yep. he sold it. And I think it's a very similar role to the one that Jagger has in the Rolling Stones. He's the guy out the front, never stops moving, never stops gesturing, getting the audience in, involved in it. Um, I think he's still, if not the greatest front man I ever saw yep. in, in terms of and it's old school show business. It's classic old school show business chops. He was not shy about that. He was never too cool to do anything. And if you watch him at Live Aid, he'll do anything to connect with that audience. <laughs> just, he doesn't stop. He's like a show pony, isn't he? He just doesn't start working. And, you know, as a fan, you sat there and and you just, I mean, because when I watch the Rio concert on YouTube and stuff like that, you just sit there going, oh, my God, what must it be like? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember watching it on TV at the time here. Um, and, it, you know, it, even at the time, everybody was talking about it. People sometimes build these things up retrospectively. But at the time, everybody came away and went, did you see Queen earlier? Did you see that? And it kind of erased. I can't remember what came before or after till I was doing the book because it really does stand out in my memory of of, of just how good they were that day. Can I call Queen my Beatles? Because I didn't. I was. I was too young to to experience the Beatles. And 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 Queen. When, just the mere mention of it, and I, and I'm like a child again. Yeah, I think you can. I think you can mention it. Yeah, you can call them. You can call them your Beatles. Because I think that's the other thing as well. I mean, Queen almost came along at the point at which the Beatles split up, didn't they? The Beatles were over by 1970. Queen were very much a band of the 70s. They always said that. They were about, they wanted to be new. They wanted to be the next thing. But I think you can call them your your Beatles. Yeah, go, go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you make your next book about Jeff Lynne and the Electric Light Orchestra? I, there's a lot of that band I don't know either. Yeah, well, it's all Jeff Lynne, I think, isn't he? Fired, he fired all the band. He did. <laughs> he kind of he runs the show. He's the mad professor, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> but he, that... you know, he just sits in that bunker recording the songs. That's and it. He sends out for a cellist. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you very much. You Thanks. you be brilliant today, okay, Mark? <clears throat> Thank you.